Okay, so we'll talk about geometric multiplier theory today. So this is a completely different way to look at optimization problems. Um, before I do that, I have to correct the expression that I had uh, written in the previous class. So, so shipping was right. So we had xk plus 1 lambda k plus 1 was xk lambda k minus alpha gradient x of L and then negative hxk. And so this is the definition of T of xk lambda k. This is a correction. And of course, the gradient of t at x and lambda is identity minus alpha second derivative of L and then negative gradient of h and then gradient of h transpose x and then 0. I think that's what shipping, very shipping. That's what you had suggested, right? So that's, this is the correct expression. And so it's the gradient of t with respect to <coughs> x, is that This is the gradient of t with respect to both x and lambda. OK. So let's move on to today's topic which is geometric multiplier theorem. OK. So what's the idea behind geometric multiplier theory? So, so far, if you recall, we started with uh, unconstrained optimization and then we came up with gradient methods. And we said, look, the function we want to optimize should have first and second derivative and so on and so forth. It should be smooth. Then we talked about optimization over a convex set. And then again, we said that the convex set has to be such that we could solve some optimization problems over the convex set. We should be able to project onto the convex set. The function has to be differentiable. The derivative has to be continuous, and so on and so forth. Then we talked about KKD theorem that requires the constraints to be regular, and that required the function f to be differentiable. The constraint should also be differentiable for the KKD conditions to hold. Then we said, let's try and come up with barrier method, augmented Lagrangian method, penalty function approach, so on and so forth. In all situations, we assumed everything to be um, differentiable, continuous. Uh, we required regularity of the points in the constraint set and so on. Okay, And those are pretty, uh, pretty strong assumptions to make in many situations where you deal with problems in which the variables are integer, for instance. Okay, so one integer, one famous integer programming problem is the traveling salesman problem, where you have different. So this is something that FedEx or USPS solves on a day-to-day -day basis. So you have various addresses at which you need to drop the packages. Okay, and there is a cost of going. In most situations, it's the time taken to move from point A to point B. So you need to figure out how to schedule the path or how to schedule the delivery of packages so that you visit all the points where you need to drop off the packages and you get back to your origin uh, with minimum amount of time required to deliver the packages. Okay, And that's an integer optimization problem. I won't write the formulation on the board. Uh, but 
essentially the problem is of this type, minimize fx such that ax less than equal to b, cx equal to d, x in 0, 1 raised to n. Okay? And you have seen a problem like this in your uh, midterm. Does, since we're, we're talking about a geometric approach here, does this have anything to do with graph theory? No. No? No. Okay. Graph theory has, uh, yeah, it, it's not geometric. It's a combinat it more related to combinatorics. Okay. Um, certainly there are graph theoretic algorithms that could solve this problem. Okay, but that's separate. Okay, so you have an optimization problem where the set X is not a convex set. The function is defined over a non-convex set, so therefore it doesn't satisfy any differentiability property unless you expand the set to be a continuous set, in which case the function might become uh, differentiable. Okay, so that's one problem where uh, many of the tools that we have developed so far, you cannot really apply to solve problems of this type, okay, because nothing is differentiable in this case and the sets, set over which you are optimizing, it's not convex. Then there is another problem called facility. So this is this is traveling salesman problem. Traveling salesman problem. And then there is this another one which is called facility location problem. So you are you want to start your own company, you want to become a competitor to Amazon and Jet.com and in order to do that, you need to have warehouses all over the U.S. so that you could deliver your products within two hours, six hours, 10 hours, 24 hours, 48 hours, whatever, okay? So, or you are Kroger and you want to figure out in a city where exactly should you have your supermarket so that people have to take minimum amount of trip to get to your, to your store, buy stuff, and go back to their home, okay? So that's a facility location problem. So again, you have a neighborhood, different neighborhoods, and you need to figure out at which neighborhood you want to open a warehouse or you want to put up your store, you want to have your gas pump, um, or if you are in civil engineering, you want to have a sewage treatment plant so that you could have, so there is a cost, so when you want to think about sewage treatment plant in a city, you have different neighborhoods, you want to collect the sewage, so you have to lay down the pipelines for the sewages to co get collected at one particular location, and then you need to treat that, and then you need to set up another pipeline to basically channel it to some river, okay? And similarly here, you need to lay down the pipelines to collect the sewage, get to all these facilities where the sewage treatment plant is located, and then you need to basically optimize this entire laying of pipelines and where exactly the sewage treatment plants need to be located. Okay, again, this is a problem exactly of this type. Okay, so integer programming problem. Uh, so how would you use some of the tools that we have developed in optimization to solve problems of this type? Okay. So we need to come up with a method that is more general and more powerful than what we have seen so far that uses derivatives of functions and derivatives of the constraint, set, constraint uh, functions. Okay, is the motivation clear? Um, even in transportation planning, you need to figure out along which routes the buses needs to be picking up and dropping off passengers. Where should you have the pick up and drop off location and all that. So these two problems are extremely uh, versatile problems because they appear in many areas of science and engineering um, in our day to day lives. So the idea is to instead of look at an optimization problem as um, as an instance of gradient descent or as an instance of uh, 
some other methods that we have studied we look at it geometrically okay we look at the geometry of the problem uh, in some specific space okay so we'll define what that space is but instead of looking at the problem um, the way we have been looking at so far we want to transform the problem into a geometric problem in some other space and then we understand the geometry of that particular space okay and that would allow us to come up with uh, what is known as a duality theory so let's do that i want to solve this problem minimize fx says that x is in x gx is less than equal to 0 and let's say f star is the minimum value the lagrangian l of x comma mu is given by fx plus mu transpose gx what else we are going to make the assumption that f star is finite so assumption is f star is finite um, and this is not an unreasonable assumption because in both these situations no matter how so of course the function is always greater than or equal to 0 right and the function is bounded because your x takes only finitely many values so your f star which is the optimal solution to these problems are always going to be finite okay it could be positive it could be negative but it cannot be plus or minus infinity so define so mu star is called a geometric multiplier if and only if mu star is greater than or equal to 0 and f star equals to inf x and x l of x comma mu mu star okay um, next I want to define the set s gx fx such that x is in capital X Yes. Um, why are there only inequality constraints, and what does that have to do with like a traveling salesman problem? So, when you have so in this particular situation, when you have inequality, when you have equality constraint, you can have h x less than equal to zero and negative h x less than equal to zero. So that can take care of equality constraints. Okay. okay. So if you have h of x equal to zero, you can treat it as h x and negative h x less than equal to zero okay okay so let's look at what does this set s looks like so I have this problem I want to minimize x such that x square is less than equal to zero 
x is in R. Then my set S would look something like this is my gx, this is my fx, and it looks like a parabola. Okay, this is this is my set S. So S is a subset of R2 in this case, um, where the x-axis is the are the values of gx, and then y-axis is the value fx for x in R, and then you basically you have a parabola. So the set S that I've defined here is essentially a parabola in R2. Let's look at another example. I want to minimize half of x1 square plus x2 square such that x is in R2 x1 minus 1 is equal to 0, or oh, is less than equal to 0. This is my gx, this is my fx, and my s is going to look something like this. This is negative 1, 0. And everything above this parabola is actually uh, um, is in the set S. Now, notice that this is in a two-dimensional space. This is also in R2. Okay, so in this case, S was just a curve, whereas in this case, it's a region above a parabola. So this parabola is, of course, included because you have less than equal to sign here. Yes. So if this one, no, this one, uh, this is just an artificial constraint. This is not a usual optimization problem. Oh, it cannot be less than zero, but it still has a set. The set S is well defined, okay? Even if there is only one point in the set, it's still well defined, okay? And it's not a point, it's actually a curve in this situation, okay? I could also have a minimum of X such that x is in 0, 1. And then in that case, your s, so this is my fx, this is my gx. I probably want to have some constraint. So let me see what constraint would make some sense. Oh, x minus half is less than equal to zero. Okay, and in this case, you would have, so when x is equal to zero, this is negative half, so gx is negative half and fx is equal to zero. And when x is equal to one, then gx is one half and fx is equal to one. So this is your one half, this is your negative half and zero, and this is your one half and one. Okay, so the s is just comprised, the, the, the set s comprises of these two points only. 
okay it's neither a curve not a region it's just two points on this two dimensional space yes it only happens to be two dimensional in this case because we're only we're only assuming one g function right that's right so this can go up to as many yes dimensions. you could have yeah uh, typically the set s would be in r r cross r Okay, but since in this case r is equal to one, so there is so so small r is equal to one because we have only one inequality constraint, one inequality constraint, one inequality constraint. So we always have s as a subset of r two. Okay, but in general, s could be in a higher dimensional space. We should understand this when it's when x is zero, or what's our when is that right? Wait, when x is one. Then it's not less than one half, or not less than zero. Yeah, it's not less than zero, but it's still a point in this space. Okay. Okay. So look at the way S is defined. It doesn't say GX has to be less than or equal to zero. Right. Right. It could be any point GX and any point FX as long as X is in the set capital X. Okay. Okay. So here capital X is just two points at zero one, and so this is one point and this is another point in S. Okay. Okay, so the definition of S is clear. Okay, it's just a set in this particular space. Okay. So now uh, I want to talk about the concept of positive half space and negative half space. Okay. So let's say I have a line. Uh, I have this space. I have a hyperplane in this space. This hyperplane has a normal. Let me call that. I want to give it a name. Um, we have used alpha, we have used beta, we have used gamma. Okay, let me call this gamma. Okay. Um, so, can someone tell me what's the formula for the hyperplane in Rn? So, this is some Rn. The normal is given by gamma. So can someone tell me what is the formula for the hyperplane? Okay, to make your life easy, let me give you a point Z in this space, in this on this hyperplane. Okay, so Z sits on this hyperplane. Anyone remembers? Not a cross product. Yes. So there was a hand in, in yeah. Did you raise your hand? Uh, no, it never, no, it never okay. <laughs> okay. So he says gamma transpose x minus z. Uh, you know, I don't want to confuse with this x, so let me give it another name u. Okay, so this is space u in Rn. So gamma transpose u minus z is equal to zero. So that's the formula for this hyperplane. And if you want to write it in another form, it's gamma transpose u equals gamma transpose z, which is actually a constant because z is some point in the plane, so you can pick any point. And so you have, so the, the this hyperplane, let me call it H, is U such that gamma transpose U is equal to C. Okay, that's the formula for this hyperplane. So that's the set of all U such that gamma transpose U is a constant. Now associated with this hyperplane, 
are two spaces. One is the positive half space, so that's H plus, which is U such that gamma transpose U is greater than or equal to C. And then a negative half space, which is H minus, which is U such that gamma transpose U is less than or equal to C. Okay, so this is known as positive half space and this is my negative half space. Okay, so positive half space, geometrically positive half space is the space above this hyperplane in the direction where gamma is pointing at and negative half space is the space below the hyperplane where negative gamma is pointing at, okay? This half space is included in positive half space and negative half space. Okay, is, is everything clear so far? Any question? Yes. Is this just a fine for uh, planes or yes. is it going to be defined for like sphere? No, no, it's just defined for planes. Okay, so this is half space, so half of the entire space. Only for hyperplanes. Okay, any other question? So things are going to get very geometric from now on, okay? So you have to switch gears in your brain. So, so far you are all trained in differentiating functions and all that stuff. Now you have to get trained on half spaces, positive half space, negative half space and stuff. Okay. So now we want to talk about hyperplanes that supports the set S, okay? So we define these three sets S and we want to talk about hyperplanes that have the entire set S on the positive side, okay? So it should be in the positive. So this entire set S has to be in the positive half space of certain hyperplanes. So let's uh, let's talk about it. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, it will come in in a few minutes. So, so let me create this hyperplane with the normal as mu comma one, okay? And the normal is pointing in this direction. So because mu is positive, the normal would always point in this direction, in this space, fx gx space. And the entire set S is actually in the positive half space of this particular hyperplane, okay? So that's a good thing. And then I could move this hyperplane up and down and it, the set S would still remain in positive hyperplane. To give you an example, I can draw this hyperplane. This hyperplane is parallel to this hyperplane, so the normal is still mu comma one. But S is still in the positive half space of this hyperplane. Let's draw another hyperplane, which is parallel to these hyperplanes, these two hyperplanes, so it still has normal mu comma one. But then the set S is not in the positive half space. Yes. Oh, I'm just picking any normal in this particular two-dimensional space. Uh, so right now, mu is an arbitrary choice. Eventually, we will make mu greater than or equal to zero. Okay. Uh, so, so right now, I have not made any assumptions on mu. 
in order to draw these hyperplanes, of course, it will turn out that these mu's are positive that are facing this direction. Uh, these mu's are negative, so this mu comma one, this mu is going to be negative. Okay, if you just uh, write a formula for a hyperplane that looks like this, and then you look at the value of mu, it will be equal to it will be a negative negative value, whereas this mu is going to be a positive value. And a mu that looks like the, a line that is parallel to the x-axis, mu is equal to zero, and then one will be the outward normal. Okay, so this would be an outward normal to this particular hyperplane. So this is something that you know you will have to go back, write the equations, and then see for yourself if that is indeed the case. Okay, so for this, for, 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 for the purpose of this class, just take it for granted that these mu's are going to be positive, this mu is going to be negative, and this mu is going to be equal to zero. A mu equals infinity would be something like this. Mu comma one, so this mu is going to be infinity. Let me write it. Okay. Of course, we are talking about two-dimensional functions right now because it's easy to, two, not two-dimensional functions, but two-dimensional spaces because it's easy to visualize, but the general idea holds in arbitrary dimensional spaces. Okay. So, so I could draw multiple hyperplanes so that the entire set S is in the positive half space of that particular hyperplane. Uh, in this case, there are many hyperplanes like this, this, and this, uh, and some of which, in some cases, uh, the set S would be in the positive half space. In some cases it will not be in the positive half space. Similarly, in this case, in this uh, particular hyperplane with normal mu comma one, the set S, which is just these two points, is in the positive half space. Um, and you could draw many such, many such lines with different values of mu. In all these cases, uh, the set S is going to be in the positive half space. Okay. So, what I'm suggesting, what, what I'm saying is, once you define an optimization problem and once you define the constraint, you can draw the constraint and the function values for all x in the domain as a set S in specific dimension space. And then you can come up with hyperplanes so that the entire set S is contained in, the, in one of the positive half space. Not one of the, it's in the positive half space. There was a question? No? So next we have visualize a visualization lemma. Currently, S is any set. Sorry. What's the? Let's say S is all of our C. Yes. Oh. Uh, right. I'm trying to think in which problem would that be the case. Would that be a very trivial problem? No, then that's just a line. 
that's just a line yeah yeah I don't know in which case you will have the entire space so yeah that's a good question but I don't know in which case you will have the entire space okay so his question was when could s be the entire of R2 so you cannot define a positive half space or negative half I mean you cannot draw a hyperplane so that the entire R2 would be in positive half space but I cannot seem to so at this point of time I'm not able to think of an example where s would be entire of R2 okay so lemma A is a hyperplane with normal mu comma 1 passing through through gx fx intercept in the steps the vertical axis at l x comma mu okay so that's the connection And now I need some, I have to erase this part of the board. So this, is this normal always defined in two dimensions? Or is this well, just... It's always defined. Always defined uh, the yeah. So because any hyperplane can be written as <coughs> gamma transpose u equals to c. Mm -hmm. So the normal is just this gamma. Okay. Right, but I guess I'm saying that that could be an n-dimensional vector. Right? Yes, it could be an n-dimensional. That's a two-dimensional vector. Uh, well, g could be in RR. But mu comma one is a two-dimensional vector. Uh, no, mu will be in RR. Okay. Okay. So mu is a vector in RR. Okay. Okay. So this is actually a vector in RR cross R. Okay, so picture. This is my set S. I have a hyperplane. This is my GX. This is my FX. I have a hyperplane with normal mu comma 1 and what this visualization lemma says is that this point is L of x comma mu its vertical axis is fx yeah and there is a point gx fx on this hyperplane okay so is that yeah so is this saying um, at x star mu star then the half positive half plane will include all the values greater than the max the optimal value we will end up saying something like that so you are all along the right track okay. uh, at this point of time I haven't made any statement about the optimal value but that's exactly what Did I will make like to the right point, uh, we are not talking about convergence yet okay 
we are getting into that point maybe two three classes later on okay so all i am saying right now is i have a hyperplane with normal mu comma 1 and there is a point gx comma fx on this hyperplane then if you look at the y intercept it's actually equal to lx comma mu okay which is given by this expression and that's because remember this gamma transpose mu no gamma transpose u equals to gamma transpose z that was the definition of the hyperplane which passes through z so that's exactly what uh, this is saying part b of the visualization lemma is uh, you know it's a pretty long statement but let me write it down I may make grammatical mistakes because I'm trying to condense it into as few words as possible. So among all hyperplanes with normal mu comma one, having S in positive half space, the highest attained interception the highest attained inter highest attained vertical intercept is inf l x comma mu x is in capital x This is the important part. So when you have more than one constraint, vertical means the f axis. You have more than one constraint. So this is two dimensional. Right. But in general, what is vertical mean? Oh vertical means this fx. Okay. Yeah. Vertical means the fx intercept. Okay, so whichever that axis is. So what what am I saying here? So I can have many hyperplanes that has s in the positive half space with the same normal as mu one. So I have this. I have this. Okay, and I have something like this. All of them have normal mu comma one. Okay. And this hyperplane has S in the positive half space. This hyperplane has S in the positive half space. But as soon as I translate this hyperplane a little bit more, then S is not in the positive half space. There is some amount of S in negative half space. Right, so that's this line, and then of course you have this line which is passing through gx comma fx. So what part B is saying, among all hyperplanes with normal mu comma one that has s in the positive half space, the highest attained vertical intercept is the inf of lx comma mu, and that's this point. So this is inf of l x comma mu, where x is in capital set X. So it gives us a lower bound on the Lagrangian. Uh, what is a, yeah, so this is a lower bound. Notice that in order to make any of these statements, I'm not making any assumptions on the set x. I'm not making any assumptions on the differentiability of the function f, not making any assumptions on differentiability of the set g. 
Okay, it's all based on geometric understanding of this set S that is a tuple GX comma FX. Now part C of the geometric multiplier of the visualization lemma is that mu star is a geometric multiplier if and only if mu star is greater than or equal to 0 and Uh, okay, it's it's also a long statement. So let me again try to rewrite it uh, with some grammatical mistakes. So mu star is a geometric multiplier if mu star is greater than or equal to zero and among all hyperplanes with normal mu star comma one. Uh, mu star comma one with s in positive half space the highest level attained the highest attained vertical intercept is F star. Okay, so I've underlined all the important parts of the statement. So, so far we have had discussion about any arbitrary mu. Uh, now, I have mu star greater than or equal to 0. So, in this case, uh, uh, I will have mu, I will have the hyperplane as this one. Okay with normal mu comma 1 and the intercept, the vertical intercept is F star. Okay, this is F star, why? Because at this point, at this point, your GX is less than equal to 0, so this is GX less than equal to 0 and the function F is minimized, so this is the function with higher values and this is the function with the minimum possible value in the set X. Okay, so this is your mu star. Okay, so all of you have written down, so again, let's face the board um, and let's try and understand all these three lemmas together. So I have any hyperplane with normal mu comma one it passes through gx comma fx, then the vertical intercept is the Lagrangian at x comma mu. I have any hyperplane with s in the positive half space. The maximum intercept is inf of lx comma mu. Okay, and mu star is a geometric multiplier if mu star is greater than or equal to zero and the intercept, the vertical intercept is actually equal to F star. Okay, so that's part C. But we don't know how to find F star yet. Yes. We don't know how to find F star, so we'll get to it in a bit. So, so far, geometrically, we can see that this is the point corresponding to F star because the function F is minimized. 
and your gx is less than equal to 0. So in this region, gx is greater than equal to 0. But in this region, gx is less than equal to 0. And the function f is minimized at this point. And so if I draw this hyperplane with s in the positive half space, it intercepts the y-axis at f star. Then mu star is a geometric multiplier. Is part c a definition or a lemma? Uh, it follows from the definition. Okay. okay. It follows from the definition, but the reason why this is a lemma is because it, uh, because of this particular region, because of this particular statement. So among all hyperplanes with normal mu star comma one, with s in positive half space, the highest attained vertical intercept is f star. So this particular part is geometric. It's not. Uh, it has a geometric flavor to it, uh, and therefore it's it's written as a lemma. Okay. Otherwise, if you start writing it in mathematical terms, then this is just this, the the definition itself. Okay. But this gives you a geometric intuition behind the definition itself. Yes. Um, you said the intercept between the the, the, mu, the, the point between the the hyperplane and the the circle is uh, x star, then purple point. No. Yes. On the, on the left. Here? Yeah. Is it the x star? Oh, so this would be, uh, yeah, so that's a good point. So what is this point? This point is g of x star, comma, f of x star. Okay. So, okay. so this is the. It is on the uh, left half plane. Yes. That means g x star is. Zero. Yeah, because this is the origin, so this is. Is it guaranteed that it will be on the left? No, it's not. OK. Um, let's see where this uh, part C would fail. OK, so maybe that would uh, give you a situation where uh, it may be difficult for this particular condition to hold. Uh, let's say my S looks like. Looks like Africa. Okay. Uh, in this case, in this case, uh, what is the optimal solution? Well, gx has to be less than or equal to zero, so I have to concentrate in this half space, and your function f has to be at the minimum value. So that's this point. This is your gx star comma fx star. And this is your f star. This is your inter optimal value f star, y intercept. But if you draw a, a hyperplane with s in the positive half space, then the hyperplane would look something like this, mu comma 1. Okay, So there is no way you can draw a hyperplane that will have s this this is your region s so you will have s in the positive half space and your y intercept is going to be f star okay there is no such hyperplane in this situation if your s looks like this um, so does that mean that there is no geometric multiplier that, that means that there is no geometric multiplier in this case okay so Let's try and draw different hyperplanes just to be able to find such a hyperplane. So if I do something like this, it cuts. So your S is not in the positive half space. If you do something like this, uh, then also S is in the positive half space, but your intercept is actually much lower than this intercept, which is probably the tightest intercept that you can get. So in this case, there is no geometric multiplier. OK, so you might as well have some optimization problems where there are no geometric multipliers. OK. Oh, the time is over. I, I had just started. OK, anyways. Uh, <laughs> 
I thought I have another 20, 30 minutes to go. Uh, anyway, so we will continue our discussion on visualization lemma and uh, weak duality theorem in the next class.